So why would you want to be independent? Well, a lot of re people go independent. The first thing is for freedom. They're not working for anyone else. They're not setting their own schedules, the rules. They're working for themselves. The second thing is choice. They got the choice of work. They can choose which jobs they work on and which jobs that they say, you know what, I, I don't like that. It's not enough money or, you know, I'd rather do more experimental flash or flex. So a lot of times they like that because they can choose the work. Another reason is variety. I mean, if you've got enough contacts, especially this industry now where it's really hot, you can pick and choose a, lot, a wide variety of jobs that you can work on. So if you get bored with some kind of like, you know, doing those typical flash sites, that, you know, video players, the next day you can be working on an enterprise flex app. You know, it's just really nice to have that variety. And because you're independent, you can choose that. You yourself have power on deciding which one you choose, which client, if you want to be associated with a big name client, it's all up to you. Also, you typically get more money. Um, as a consultant, you can typically charge a lot more than you do as W-2, typically to offset the risk of not having steady work coming in. But in this industry right now, I mean, the, the pay is in consulting, professional flex, flex, flash, all that yourself. So the cons of independent are not really people like to talk about, but the one thing is you get a lot less time. Typically when you work nine to five or W-2 with a set, set of hours in a reasonable project management that you know, doesn't expect you to work weekends, you don't have a lot of time. You're spending a majority of your time working, looking for clients, uh, you're looking for your next job, your next gig, trying to understand how long it's gonna last. Sometimes you're doing time estimations for free in project management on a project you'll never get to. So you're spending that time doing that, and that's during work hours, after work hours. I mean, you're really the one, since you're in charge, setting those hours. So you're typically working your ass off. I mean, all day, you're not, you know, you don't really have enough time for yourself, and you have to really balance that. So that's a big con that a lot of people just don't like. They want to be able to clock out, come home for the day, and, you know, zen at their house. Some people, like me, workaholics, want to do it 24-7, love it, it's passionate. So a lot of times they don't view it as work. Um, it is more work. It's a lot harder work than W-2. There's a lot of leg room and leg work things that you have to do that you typically don't have to do as an independent um, W-2. A lot of people do. Project management, that's all done for you. Client management, here I have a bunch of client managers as W-2, whereas if I'm an independent, I'm the one calling the phone with the client. I'm the one doing the project management. I'm the one doing task allocation. You could even be managing, right, other people that you're working with. How much of that time is spent actually coding, right? So you're charging for that and keeping track of it. That's a, that's a lot of work. Another thing that a lot of people don't like to talk about is less respect. There are people, especially in bigger companies, who see you as a threat to their job. They see you as a threat to their you know, well-being. Like, well, how come we can't do it? And they had to hire this contractor. So you can lose respect from that from, you know, from day one. The second you walk in the door, you have a different color badge that identifies you as a contractor you know, you, they lose respect for you, and that, that can come across. And it's always up hard for you to maintain that professional level of professionalism to d just, you know, be mature about it and understand that that's going to happen. However, a lot of times it's offset by more respect. Sometimes people say, you know, I could never do that. I could never do 1099, handle the taxes. I could never, you know, do, play all those roles, work all those hours and do that. So sometimes it's offset by that. It just depends on uh, what type of company, big or small, you're dealing with. So let's talk about, talk about there's really two main types of independence. There's the contractor who's hired muscle. Basically, someone has a project and they'd like you to do it. That is a contractor. You're hired muscle to do that project. The second type is a consultant. A consultant is more of a hired professional. So contractors are more likely that people work at home in their jeans at their home, do a lot of flash work, and then do whatever the heck they want, you know, assuming they work for two hours, go play some Xbox, and come back. Consultants are viewed more as hired professionals. They are typically more on site with clients, interacting with a lot of uh, stakeholders such as management, uh, client managers, project managers, understanding requirements. They have more of a, an ingrained role. The names are very interchangeable, but in my experience, those have been really the two defining roles in what they do. Um, there's also the people who just do it in their spare time. They're not really a contractor, but they you know, have four hours at the end of the day, and they could probably do like a four hour flash project to create a widget or maybe a small flash site they could do over two weekends. You know, if you have the spare time for that, there's a lot of contractors who do that. So let's talk about the requirements of getting started for contracting. Um, I made a mistake when I did it, I dove right in, and I think I made about $500 in three months. Suffice it to say, I was out of my apartment in three months, living with my mom and parents again because I didn't have any money. So I learned from them as, those mistakes, and I kind of developed what I would think are some just baseline requirements. You get these, you should be good to go. 
So the first thing is you've got to have work. If you don't have any work, you don't know where there is work to get, you're not going to be able to make money as a contractor. You've got to identify where you're going to get work. Is it going to be online? Is it from friends or referrals? Or does your company, you know, if you leave on good terms, uh, do you know the type of work that they were looking for? Can you do that as a professional offline? For me, yeah, I make flash you know, applications and flex applications. I know that there's a lot of other people that have needs for that, so I know I can do that. Um, the second thing is you gotta have a network. If you don't have anybody that you know in the industry, uh, you're gonna have a really hard time of, of getting connections, getting information on how things are, getting comparisons of how work's going. Are you seeing an uptick in work? Are you seeing a downturn? Do you know anybody for this type of work, you know, for referrals? You've got to have a network of people that you can ask questions to, uh, bounce ideas off of, rant about frustrations with clients. You know, it really helps to have a network of people that you can communicate with. The third thing is references. Some clients, more for, so for contractors than con consultants, are looking for references. People that can say, yeah, I worked with him on a project. He did a good job, right? It's not really a reference like a work reference, like on your resume that says, you know, this guy, you know, you have the three references in the bottom and then they call. Those are certain laws around that that are different than contractor. You're just looking for somebody to say, he's a good guy. So that way your potential client will have a good feeling about you. It's good to have references that can say that about you. And if you need to get references, you don't have any, go do some work for some people. Maybe, I wouldn't say charge them less, but go do some work and say, look, I'm really trying to develop a reference. I really want to make this project, you know, be right from day one. I want to leave here and give you a product and have you feel good about what I gave you so you can tell other people about that. And if you, you know, clearly communicate expectations, there's a lot of people that will work with that because they, they want to know that you're really obsessed with a good job, right? Just don't let them take advantage of you. So the next thing is getting legal. Uh, you got to have a tax person and or more preferably a CPA. If your job as a flex and or flash contractor consultant is to do code and all the other things that are responsible for that around being independent, you don't have time to be doing receipts and you know, doing your expenses and tracking that. It's a necessary evil to keep you know, a little bit of organization. Some people, especially the more business minded, are very good at that and they're very good at keeping organized so it makes it easier over time. They have the discipline, some are not. Some, like me, like to code 24 seven. I make more money paying someone else to do it than I do doing it myself. I can sit there and you know, do contracting. So bottom line, it, they're also gonna give you tax breaks because there's different state laws, different country laws depending on who you're working with. So it's just, it's really nice to have someone who's, who you know is competent and capable of doing that. This is where the references come in. If you know some other contractors, they can typically refer you, a tax guy or CPA, pretty quickly. Uh, you need a lawyer. Lawyers aren't used a lot of times, uh, but it's just good to have a lot, bounce contracts off and that maybe, you know, you read a contract and go, this is weird. Well, you're not a lawyer, send it to a lawyer, he'll tell you what it is. They charge up the yang, but that's money well spent for, for feeling good, you know, that peace of mind, right? So you need a lawyer for that. Um, there's also bigger jobs that you want to start protecting yourself for. If you don't want to risk losing large amounts of money, it's better to have lawyers to look over contracts and your contracts as well. They can write them and, you know, just have them say everything looks good. We can do a corp to corp and have them handle it, right? Um, and, you know, bad things happen and it's good to have a lawyer to say, what are my options? You know, this client didn't pay me or this client is trying to sue me. You know, you got to have a lawyer to protect. It's better to know them, have a relationship established when those bad things happen rather than be stressed and panicking trying to find one, right? So the third thing is you need to incorporate, at least in the US, United States of America, you have to have either an LLC, an S Corp, C Corp, or something along those lines that, two things. A, it shields you from certain tax things that are legal, right? You don't need to feel bad about expensing things. It's just part of the doing business. The second thing is it helps protect you and your assets. For example, LLC, limited liability. That's why it's called that. You're limited in the liability that you assume. So if I do work, let's say, with government clients or they have just, you know, dangerous products or maybe I'm writing medical software, I can feel confident that my house and car aren't going to be taken away if for whatever re reason things go south, right? So it also helps with the government and taxes. Like all those things combined, you just need to do it. You don't need to advertise your company. You don't need to say, I'm with blah company. You just, it's all, it's a lot of times most contractors, consultants, it's on paper. It's all it's there for. Uh, place of work. This is kind of the big one. Uh, where are you going to work? Where's your office? You know, if you're independent, you pretty much choose where you work, right? So me, I, I sometimes choose to work at home. Not all the time. Um, there was, there's also a lot of uh, what I would like to call e-hatcheries. They're kind of like offices where for small startup companies or just people who need an offsite and don't have room in the building because of fire codes, right? So they'll send you to these offsite offices. 
you can lease rent for a long time. You know, there's uh, other places that it lease and rent out rooms that you could make into your office, right? So you can do that as well. Sometimes they're cheaper. Um, and, you know, classic San Francisco Starbucks or a coffee shop, right? Starbucks charges for wireless. The coffee shops do not. Starbucks has a brand name coffee, typically has, you know, guaranteed geeks to come to, right? So in those two places, you just walk up to Starbucks and work all day. I do that too sometimes. Use the wireless, get coffee, and it's good to go. Um, the important thing, though, is you need to feel good about your office. You need to, especially in the flash world, it's a little bit more creative. You need to go there and feel secure. You need to feel good, and especially you know anything creative. You want, you gotta want to work there. You gotta feel inspired to create, inspired to, you know, create what you're good at. And if that environment you're in helps, you know, fuel that, very good. If not, get another place to work. So let's talk about the skills. There's different types of skills that are required for doing independent work than there are for, say, W-2. Time estimations. If you're W-2, time estimations, a lot of people may have more experience than you. If not, you know, you're constantly saying, how long would this project take? We need to budget, blah, blah, blah. 1099 is a little different because the client's going to hold you accountable, not your project manager or not your sales guy, you. So you need to be very good at giving time estimations. Uh, yeah, it'll take me 60 hours. Okay, I'm over 20. Uh, I'm going to have to charge the client for that, and I don't want to talk to him. So suddenly you've put yourself in a negative position. That's just very bad. You don't want to do that. So you need to be very good at allocating, how long is something going to take? This is software. It's not an exact science. And the client who expects you to have to the T hours, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. But you just need to give your best stab, best swag, and you can constantly reassess. Say, look, you know, I can do this in X amount of time, but this, I'm not really sure. It's a high risk. You know, and if you're honest, They'll, they'll be fine with that. Uh, the next thing is project planning. Project planning is you can identify what needs to happen to get something done, right? I need to get design comps before I know what I'm designing, or I need to get design comps and interaction specs and wireframes to know how this interacts. I need to get a database schema to recognize what my data objects are. You know, how do these things work? I need some of all of these. If I don't get this by this date, then this is not going to happen. It's going to push our deadline. I'm going to go off and work on another project waiting for you guys, and I might not be able to come back at a drop of a hat, right? You need to be able to do project planning, not just for the project, but your time in it, because you may be on dual jobs. It just depends on what you're working on and you know, what they're willing to pay, right? So project planning is a very better skill you better have as a contractor versus W-2, you can typically have a PM do it. Cost assessment. How much is this going to cost? Cost assessment goes a little bit with time estimations and project planning. And that cost assessment is, it's probably going to take me four hours to do this, and I charge $10 an hour, $50 an hour. It's going to cost X. OK, that's easy. But as you know, most Flash and Flex projects tend to grow in scope, and it becomes very challenging to say, how much is this going to cost? If someone wants a rich internet application that, let's say, manages uh, their image assets, like Flickr, and you want to create that in Flex, how much is that going to cost? Ready, go. It's a hard question. It's a very hard question. And answering that is going to you know, require all your skills to understand, OK, it's going to take me X amount of time. These are the risks. These are the people who need to be involved, not just me. This is how much I'm going to have to be involved. This is going to take away from that. right? You need to keep all those things factored in so you can understand how much this is going to cost. And then you give a quote to a client and say, here's how much it's going to cost. OK, we don't like that. Do you feel confident enough to say, well, I put a lot of work in this, and I feel confident in these numbers? That's, that's where all three of them come into play. So here's some nice to haves. Talk the talk. Can you go in and talk to business devs and have them understand what the heck you're saying? Typically, engineers and designers who talk to upper level management, sales, even client managers, they sometimes have to have a translator, typically project managers or program managers. Um, so you need to be able to talk the talk. You also need to be able to talk the talk to the engineers, right? You can't go in there and go, yeah, I know open interfaces, and then make them feel nervous that you don't really know what you're talking about. And then they go whisper into management. You need to be able to. Say, so, yeah, I know what an interface is. I can define it. I understand the mediator pattern and can tell you how to use it, how it's used in Flash, how it's used wrong, right? Talk the talk. Being able to talk to somebody on their level, make them feel comfortable with you, working with you, and want to establish a relationship. Or developers, like, you know, they, they're going to ask you different questions. Designers, they, want to, they basically want to hear certain things. Can you do that? Presentation. Are you on time? Do you have decent hygiene? Do you wear decent clothes that say, I would trust this guy with $80,000 in the next three months? Can you do that? Can you do that presentation? It's a nice to have. Sometimes you're allocated by a consulting firm or maybe a friend. So you, don't, you, know, you can sit on your references a little bit. But you know, typically, especially in the consulting role, you have to you know, have a very 
good presentation, play the game, wear the clothes, things like that. Uh, experience. If you haven't been doing Flash or Flex for a while or any software development, and I don't mean des design either, I mean just you know, straight up development, you're gonna have a hard time transitioning to independent day one because you don't have experience in software. So doing cost assessment and everything else is very hard to do. The more experience you have, that trickles out into a multitude of different skill sets that you have of understanding how software works, the life cycle, and you can utilize that. So experience is a very, very nice to have. 